Uh, I want you to imagine that you're the president of a country. You can choose your country. You could be president of South Africa, that's a good choice, uh, and an important position. You could be prime minister of the United Kingdom, or you could be any country you like. And you really care about climate change. You were in Durban, probably, and you saw the demonstration in the street, and you went to all the stands, and you really care about climate change. And your job, your job is how do you sell that message about the importance of climate change to the people in your country? And you might have made a good choice. You might have chosen a country which is growing fast, has lots of money, uh, where the uh, children really care about climate change and their parents really care about climate change. Or you might have chosen a country where none of those things is true. And if you come from Europe, that's the situation you would be facing. Um, the currency is in crisis. The economies are in crisis. There is a public debt which is causing everybody to pull in their belts and not spend any money. Schools are being closed or hospitals. People are losing their jobs. And you want to talk to them about climate change that's too far away, too far in the future. It's somebody else's problem. And it's very difficult to get people excited about climate change. So look at the public opinion surveys, certainly in my country, maybe even in some of your countries. The enthusiasm for climate change has in the past been quite high, but is going down. If you ask people, what are the 20 things that are most important to you and your family today? They will talk to you about jobs, about schools, about hospitals, about old age pensions, uh, about crime, maybe about immigration. They won't talk to you about climate change. So you're sitting in your presidential palace. Maybe you have a palace. Maybe you don't have a palace. You just have an office. But you're either in your palace or your office. And your question to your advisors sitting around is, how do I tell people why climate change is important and how do I make them enthusiastic about climate change? And that's the question we are all going to face when we leave the bubble of Durban where everybody cares and we go out into the world where only some people care. And really that's what I want to talk about uh, today. I'm a researcher, so when I get a question like that, I also think, what can I learn from past history and from other events and from the literature on climate change? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that from the perspective of the organization that Steph mentioned, which is the Climate and Development Knowledge Network. And here's the problem we have to solve. It's the politics of climate change. People are making pledges. Uh, Europe has made a very strong pledge to reduce emissions by 20% by 2020, and they may even go to 30%. Other countries have made good pledges. But it's not enough, it's not enough, because with the pledges that we have, we're looking as though we're going to get well beyond two degrees, we may get to four degrees, or even some people think six degrees. Let's talk about how we make the case. Well, first of all, we need to understand something about climate change. We talk a lot in our world about mitigation. Mitigation is about solar energy and windmills and reducing the cost, the carbon, cost of industry. We talk a lot about adaptation. Adaptation is about building dikes and protecting ourselves against floods. But there's something else we need to worry about, which is the third circle on our diagram, which is development. If we don't manage mitigation and adaptation in a way which contributes to development, to jobs, to security for people, to peace and stability in the world, then we will have failed. You can have as many windmills as you like and as many dikes as you like, but if you don't have jobs, who cares? So that's the job that we're trying to deal with. And there are some big changes coming in terms of development. What do we then do about the particular problem of climate change? I take six lessons for our presidents and prime ministers and for all of you in thinking about how to make this the topic that will change the world and not simply change the speeches in a conference center. There are six things we have to do as leaders in this area. The first is we have to say to people, do you know what? Actually, doing something about climate change is worth doing not for the climate because there are other gains. You know, for example, 
persuade your children to turn the lights off in their bedroom when they come down for supper, it's good for the climate because they're using less electricity, but it's also good uh, because you're saving money because they've turned the lights off. Some of you are parents of children. You'll know that that is an impossible thing to ask your child to turn the light off in their bedroom because they never do it. But if you can persuade them, this will be good for the planet and good for you. And there are many examples that companies are finding where if you invest for the climate, you also save money. And I'll give you one example from a very big company in the UK, Marks and Spencers. Marks and Spencers sells clothes and household goods and food. They thought they ought to go green. So they've created a budget, 200 million pounds, to change their shops, to put energy efficiency measures in place, to look at the packaging of their goods. And they were amazed because doing all those things, they saved money. They didn't spend a penny of the 200 million pounds, they saved money because energy efficiency and better packaging is a win-win for companies and for businesses and for households. And so we need to persuade our children to turn the lights off up and down the value chain. Secondly, we need to look for ways in which we can help the climate, but also achieve other benefits. For example, Toronto, the largest city in Canada, used to have electricity provided by coal-fired power stations. And they've closed them all down. Why did they do that? They did it not because they were worried about the climate, but it's a really good thing to do for the climate. They did it because they were worried about smog and pollution uh, in their city. They wanted to eliminate the smog. They closed the coal-fired power station. It was very successful for the smog, but it was also very good for the climate. And there are many such examples where countries are taking action on climate change, benefiting the climate, but for other reasons. They're worried about energy security and not being able to import gas from Russia or oil from around the world. I think many of our countries, we have that possibility to look for the co-benefits. Reducing congestion in towns by making the public transport more efficient is good for people, but good for the climate. Third thing, sitting in our presidential palace, we need to say to people, you need to do this because otherwise the disasters will increase in number and intensity. We work in Pakistan, and we're going to hear from Pakistan in a minute. The terrible floods in Pakistan in 2009 cost the country many thousands of lives. Many hectares of crops were ruined. The total cost was $10 billion. Now, $10 billion is a lot of money in my country, and it's probably a lot of money in your countries. The total economy of Pakistan is $170 billion, so this was... One seventeenth, which is about 6% of the total economy of Pakistan, was the cost of that flood. Of course, if you face threats like that, caused by the glaciers melting or excessive rainfall, it pays you to invest in stronger bridges, better dams, better defenses, because you have an enormous benefit in return for that cost. And we see it in every country in the world, the numbers of floods, of hurricanes, of droughts of forest fires increasing and each of those cost lives and they cost money and we can solve that problem by investing in reducing carbon emissions number four and this is one which is absolutely evident here in durban investing in a greener economy is the best business decision that companies can make um career a spectacular success in economic development in the next phase of its development has set really ambitious targets for the new industries, for bioenergy, for solar, for the electronics, light uh, emitting diodes and those kinds of things. These are the new industries which are going to power the Korean economy and the Korean economy is going to invest in them. And that is true whether we get a global carbon price or we don't. Denmark has just elected a new government. They have set the most ambitious climate targets in the world. And the Danish companies are queuing up outside the door to invest in these areas. The shipping companies, the wind, the electricity, the electricity generation, the architects, the urban design people all say there is a new industrial revolution beginning. We want to be part of that because that is the future of our industry. Not to be stuck in an old industry, but to be present in a new industry which is growing and dynamic. Now that's gonna happen around the world. 
And all of us need to be involved in, in this. And that's why the development circle is so important. Because we can't say that climate change is something for the Americans and the Chinese and the British to do, and we can just sit and wait. And we can't say that adaptation is simply about protecting ourselves against the worst excesses of the weather, because we simply can't wait. These things, these new industries are going to change the whole world economy, and we cannot be left behind in developing countries using old technology, producing things in the old way, and hoping that we will be able to be part of a growing world economy. Finally, still in our presidential palace, we need to say to people, as Gordon Brown did, I can't do this without you. And there is a lot of theory on this and about the importance of public pressure. And I'll just give you one example. Some of you work in offices. Some of those offices have a kitchen. And here's the research question. Why don't people steal the tea bags in the kitchen? Because most of these kitchens, you have a kettle, and you have some tea, and you have coffee. Why don't people steal the tea bags? And the answer is that if you were to steal the tea bags, you were putting them into your pocket or into your bag, and one of your colleagues came into the room and saw you, the news would go round the office like lightning. And people would say, you see that Simon Maxwell? He stole the tea bags. And so you don't do it, because you don't want to get caught. Well, that's a message for all of us who are campaigning and working on climate change. We want to embarrass people so that if they don't do it, uh, they will get caught. And I think we have to think about how we plan our conversations with leaders, and leaders can help us by this reverse lobbying that I talked about. And finally, uh, and then I finish, Steph, this comes back to leadership. Um, if you have a government which sets ambitious targets, as Korea has done, and as Denmark has done, and as we've tried to do in Europe. If you have such a leader who stands up every time and says, climate change matters, you must think about climate change, you must act on climate change, then that's how leadership works. People will follow. And I'll give you one very interesting example, which is not from climate change. Uganda had one of the worst HIV AIDS epidemics in the world. I think the prevalence was well over 15% of the whole population was HIV positive. President Museveni told his ministers, all of you, you might be the minister for transport or the minister for roads or the minister for the army. Every time you stand up to make a speech, every single time, the first thing you say is wear a condom. Wear a condom. And they did it. And of course, with lots of other things going on as well and some international support, the prevalence rate in Uganda fell faster than anywhere else in the world. That's leadership. It's about having a strong vision and repeating it every day until it becomes part of the culture of a, of a society. And I think that's the demand that we should make of our leaders, but also the demand we should make of ourselves that we make climate change part of every conversation. It's leadership that also works through how we manage the threats and the risks and how we manage disasters. It's about how we look for co-benefits and stitch together compromises and deals which will deliver more than one thing at the same time. And it's about looking for these quick win-wins like Marks and Spencers that will save us money. That's the, this is the politics of climate change. And my proposition for the discussion this afternoon is that if we do that, if all of us each individually provides the right leadership, then we can make the change.